Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Um, I have one additional notice to the notice sheet, and it is this. There is a little book called Just a Village Kid. It's on sale from today. It's written by June McCleave, who is Peter McCleave's mum, and that, at a cost of £10 each, all the proceeds will go to DKMS. Please see Margaret Walker if you would like to buy one, and there is a copy out on the table in the vestibule if you'd like to have a peruse before you buy. Other than that, it just leaves me to welcome not only Keith Robinson, but also Jackie Booth to lead our worship this morning. So we look forward to your message. <laughs> seem to be wired for sound and we're trying to sort out Jackie's uh, mic so hopefully uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be okay it's good to be with you again uh, several years since I've been to Yarm and I, I always enjoy uh, worshipping with you uh, and I'm sure it'll be a time of blessing for us all uh, Jackie Booth is a local preacher on note in other words she just started on the journey to become a fully accredited local preacher. And uh, unfortunately for Jackie, but fortunately for me, she's coming with me uh, round the circuit, helping to lead worship, and uh, shortly we hope that she'll progress to on trial, uh, but she's got to do a sermon before then. <laughs> so it's good to be with you, and we greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some words from Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. You servants of the Lord, praise his name. May his name be praised now and forever, from the east to the west. Praise the name of the Lord. The Lord rules over all the nations. His glory is above the heavens. Praise the Lord. And we continue to praise the Lord as we sing our first hymn. If you're following in the book, it's number 88. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty.
Good morning, everyone, and thank you for that. Thank you for that lovely welcome and introduction, Keith. Thank you. It is lovely and a blessing to be able to worship with you this morning, as Keith says, as I continue on my journey to train to be a local preacher. Now, let us come before God with our prayers of adoration, confession, and thanksgiving. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are the one who is eternal, everlasting and ever-present. We praise your mighty name. Creator God, for the vastness of the universe and this world full of beauty and majesty, we praise your mighty name. Loving God, we are so privileged to be called your children. We are accepted, forgiven, and embraced. We praise your mighty name. Eternal God, you are the power behind the cross of Christ. We worship and adore you and praise your mighty name. A prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. Your spirit gives light, but we have preferred darkness. Your spirit gives wisdom, but we have been foolish. Your spirit gives power, but we have trusted in our own strength. Forgive us, Father, when, as Jesus commanded, we have not loved one another as Jesus loves us and we have not loved our enemies and prayed for those who persecute us. Forgive us, Father, when we fail to listen to you and carry out your instructions. Forgive us, Father, for the many times we take for granted all that you have done for us. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, forgive our sins. But we also want to thank you, Lord, Thank you for the opportunity to be together in prayer this morning. Thank you for the freedom to meet together here in your house to praise and worship you. Thank you for your patience you show us when so often we cause you pain. Thank you for the grace you show us even when we turn away. Thank you for your mercy that reaches out to us all. And most of all, we thank you for the gift of your Son, our precious Lord and Saviour, who freed us from our sin. In Jesus' name, Amen. And now we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We sing together again our second hymn this morning. Hymn number 429, Lord, we turn to you for mercy. Hymn 429. <laughs>
Apologies, I seem to be having a trip to the tropics at the moment. <laughs> you ladies will understand. <laughs> we come now to our Bible readings this morning. And the first one is from the Old Testament, um, 2 Kings chapter 18. And just a little bit of context. The two books that make up 1 and 2 Kings describe the history of Israel and Judah in the time of the prophets. We have Elijah, followed by Elisha, and then towards the end of 2 Kings, the prophet Isaiah. The books are full of descriptions of the many kings that ruled over the kingdom of Israel in the north and Judah in the south. The kings had responsibility for making sure God's will was done among the people. They were expected to observe God's covenant and laws, to defend the nations and engage in offensive war when necessary, and also to rule the people with justice and righteousness. The books of Kings remind us that we must serve God only. We must not serve false gods. We must listen to God's words and not do evil deeds. There are about 20 kings in all mentioned in the two books of kings after David and his son Solomon, both good and bad. Well, actually, more bad than good were the kings. Until we come, that is, to the reign of Hezekiah in chapter 18. So, Stuart, may we have our first reading, please? Thank you. In the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made, for up to that time the Israelites had been burning incense to it. It was called Nehushtan. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not cease to follow him. He kept the commands of the Lord had the, he kept the commands the Lord had given Moses, and the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. Thank you. And now our New Testament reading is taken from Mark's Gospel, chapter twelve. These verses are about the great commandments. At the centre of the message of Jesus is a love relationship with the Lord our God, which starts with your heart and then overflows into a love for other people, a reminder to us about what is important in our journey with God. Thank you, Stuart. May we have our second reading. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding and with all your strength. And to love your neighbour as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, 
no one dared ask him any more questions. Thank you. We stand to sing again our next hymn, which is hymn number 516. What shall I do, my God, to love? Please stand those who are able. 516. let us pray may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable to you O Lord our strength and our redeemer Amen for those of you who like a text to uh, take away with you and think about the uh, following week turn to 2 Kings 18 and verse 5 Hezekiah trusted in the Lord. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord. I wonder what you were thinking when that great commandment passage was read from Mark's Gospel. A reminder that the Gospel, the good news, is all about loving God and loving our neighbour. To love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. In other words, to live wholly for God. Soren Kierkegaard is a Danish theologian, and he said, Purity of heart has been defined as willing one thing, to live wholly after God. I don't know about you, but I find this really challenging. I love God, and I love to worship him. I love Jesus, and have promised to serve him. I pray that God's spirit will live in my heart and guide me in all I do. But, but, I keep falling short. And I suspect we're all the same. We admire the saints who've gone before us, 
or live amongst us and who inspire us with their single-minded devotion. But single-mindedness and wholeheartedness are not very popular concept in this freewheeling 21st century. In fact, we're a bit suspicious of them because they smack of intolerance. Perhaps we think the only way to live wholly after God is to shut ourselves away from all the taintedness and temptations of our society. Perhaps to live in a hermitage on the Farne Islands. Or go and live in a monastery, as Martin Luther did. Or live in a convent or, or, or a retreat. It won't happen, will it? So we have to develop a greater trust in God. There's a hymn we sing, a lovely hymn, and one of the verses starts off, Give me a pure and perfect heart from doubt and fear and sorrow free. The mind which was in Christ in part, let my spirit cleave to thee. For quite a number of years, we lived in West Yorkshire in a place called Murfield. It's between... Huddersfield and Dewsbury. And you may have heard of Murfield because there is a monastery there. It's called the Community of the Resurrection. It's an Anglican monastery uh, and I suppose the most famous uh, monk who, who lived there was Father Trevor Huddleston. But in the little village around this monastery, it's a place called Battyford. And in Battyford, there's a few houses, well, there was, probably overspilling now, uh, a few houses, there's a Methodist church, and you had to climb up lots of steps, like coming up into this pulpit, to get into the Methodist chapel, up a lot of steps. And opposite the Methodist chapel was a little post office and shop. And Mrs. Greenwood was the post mistress and her and her husband, they, they, uh, they ran the post office. And so uh, all the people used to go and get the stamps and bits of shopping. And it was like, uh, you know, spread all the latest news. And Mrs. Greenwood was telling me one day that the monks from the community often came in to the post office. Now, the monks walked about Battyford and Murfield in their habits uh, they had normal trousers on, but they also had sandals. And uh, they w walked about and talked to people and visited people and went to the school and, and so on. And Mrs. Greenwood said they often come in for a cup of tea and I invite them into the back. That must be the special place. And we have a good chat. And she said they, you will you've got no idea about how many of the brothers are really struggling. They are struggling with their vows, vows of poverty, obedience, and chastity. Giving themselves wholly to God and living in a closed environment did not banish temptations. And they were really struggling with life. However, there's nothing new under the sun, according to Ecclesiastes. And this dilemma of living wholly after God was also true in 9th century BC, 900 years before Christ, in Israel and Judah. And people lived in an era of competing ideologies and lifestyles. Many of God's chosen people regarded a reliance on God alone as a quaint relic of Israel's former existence as a pastoral wandering people. Now, now they were city dwellers with money and possessions and a hedonistic lifestyle. 
Enjoy yourself, they said. Enjoy yourself. Live for the moment. Put yourself first for a change. This notion of trusting in God alone is too radical and too out of date, they said. Does that sound familiar? So let me introduce you to Hezekiah. One of the kings, as, as Jackie said, that uh, there are 20 odd kings mentioned in the, in, in the book of Kings. And it reminded me of, uh, of, of a book that uh, was going the rounds when I was in the sixth form. So it'd be about 60 odd years ago. And the book was called 1066 and All That. And it was a little paperback, I think a penguin paperback, and it went through the history of the uh, English kings and queens uh, with a short summary of what happened in their reign, uh, whether they were good or whether they were bad. And this king did this and this and this, uh, but he was a bad king. And the next king mentioned that he was a very bad king. Occasionally they came to, he was a good king. So they kind of summarized uh, British history. Well, uh, the book of Kings is a bit like that. We have descriptions of various kings and then a comment at the end uh, about how, how good a king they were. And at the end of this one, it said, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord. Hezekiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He destroyed the temples and the trappings of the false gods. He held fast to the Lord. He kept the commands the Lord had given. He rebelled against foreign kings and powers and defeated them. Assyria, the strongest and mightiest nation of the time, had been defeated. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord. What a saint. What a wonderful God-fearing man. What a role model. But we also read that he struggled to live wholly after God. That is, to trust in God completely. He wasn't perfect. And his kingdom was threatened again by Assyria. This time his trust in God failed. And instead of relying on God, he tried to, to buy off the enemy with money. Ten tons of silver. Ten tons of gold. Taken from the temple. He was using God's money to, to buy off the Assyrians. His fear, worry, and uncertainty got the better of him. And he dealt with the problem in his own way. He wasn't perfect. And later we read that Hezekiah's people were subjected to psychological pressure. They were told, do not follow the king's persuasion to trust in God, for he is misleading you. The Assyrians had come back. They were trying to turn the people against Hezekiah. The Lord will not deliver you. Has any God of any nation ever survived against military might? Surrender now, and you will receive food and wine, fresh water, everything you need. The people were tempted. But Hezekiah had learned his lesson not to rely on his own resources for a solution. Hezekiah was fearing the worst, but he'd learned to trust in God. He was at the end of his strength. He threw himself on God's mercy and left the matter with God. And in the end, God saved the people because Hezekiah had trusted in the Lord. So what do we learn from all this? Well, I think the first thing we learn 
is that all of us are only one decision away from failing to trust God. Just because we've trusted God in the past is no guarantee we'll do so in the future. Sometimes we cannot see a solution to a problem or a concern. Sometimes we think God has forgotten us, that God has, he hasn't heard our prayers. Sometimes we think we know best. Sometimes it's easy to deal immediately with an issue rather than wait for God. Sometimes it's much less hassle to go along with the flow of a godless society. Search your heart. What new situation might you face that calls for a new level of trust? And when it happens, will you trust in the Lord? Or not? And the second point I would say is this. Are you like Hezekiah? And I'm afraid too often like me. Do you have to be at the end of your tether before you hand things over to God? How much easier it is when I remember that absolutely nothing in my life is just my concern. God cares about the most insignificant parts of my life. Everything I am and do is dependent on his gracious care. I am slowly learning this, yet I keep forgetting and impatiently try to deal with things in my own way. If only I would stop to remember past mercies, past mercies and past blessings I've received in my family life, in my church life, when at work, at leisure, when things seemed bleak. Oh yes, I, I've handed things over to God and then continued to worry. When I've been at the end of my strength, God has answered. Learn to live wholly after God and learn to trust him. He will not fail you. And then thirdly, we live in an instant age an instant age with little toleration for delayed gratification. We want instant meals, instant success, instant responses, and instant answers to our prayers. Hezekiah prayed earnestly to God for deliverance from the Assyrians. And it was probably some time before God answered because we read later on, uh, about three years after uh, Hezekiah had made this prayer to God for deliverance, then Isaiah sent a message to Hezekiah, about three years after his prayer. And it was three years before the Assyrians were defeated. God answered Hezekiah's prayer. And in the meantime, the people had to, uh, to sow crops on the basis of their trust in God's promise. Because to show they, they, they trusted God, uh, Hezekiah told them to, to plant uh, seeds, to sow crops, knowing they would have to wait for a year or perhaps longer before the crops could be harvested. They had to stay in the same place and rely on God's promises. Jesus told us to be persistent in prayer. I know from personal experience that God will eventually answer all my prayers. For example, it was eight years, eight years before an earnest and continuous prayer was answered by God. You might need to keep on bringing your cares and worries to God, perhaps daily, before you see great changes. Just as a fisherman needs to keep casting the line 
until he gets a bite. Be faithful, trust in God, and know that he will bless you mightily. All of us have a a give-up time when we become discouraged through dashed hopes or losing what's precious to us or when God appears to be deaf. The more tenacious have a give-up line a bit further on. But if we don't give up, we will see God working in miraculous ways. We may have to risk looking foolish and powerless or ungrateful or pushy. Often it's these and similar fears that prevent us from trusting God to the point where miracles happen. So my message this morning is keep going. Learn to trust God and miracles will happen in God's own time. And in conclusion, let me say that often our trust in God is not absolute. We spend a lot of time and money and energy in getting the the externals of life right and sometimes can compromise our faith. We want insurance on the side in case God doesn't deliver. Search your heart. Discover what you are like. See what your life is centred upon and what is important to you. Keep asking God to show where you are and where you are compromising your faith and learn to throw yourself on his mercy and grace. He will not fail you. God will not fail you. He will bless you. He will use you. He will save you. And may people say of us, as they did of Hezekiah, that we trusted in the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So we turn again to the hymn book. A hymn by the Reverend Fred Pratt Green. When our confidence is shaken in beliefs we thought secure, when the spirit in its sickness seeks but cannot find a cure, God is active in the tensions of a faith not yet mature. 644.
for our prayers of intercession this morning. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, would you please respond with, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the presence of your power and majesty, we bring our prayers for others. Help us now as we seek guidance and strength into doing your will as lived out and revealed to us by your Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour and King. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. we pray for a world of nations and factions seemingly forever in conflict. We read of rulers who continue to ignore the wishes of their peoples for rights and freedoms and who only seek to protect their own power and position. Yet, Lord, among darkness and chaos, there are men and women who know that mediation and dialogue can break down seemingly impenetrable barriers and that education can bring greater understanding and tolerance where there once was ignorance and hatred. So we pray in the name of the Prince of Peace for peacemakers and arbitrators, educators and facilitators and for all those who are prepared to stand up for justice and freedoms, for they do your will, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for your worldwide church in all its different forms. Help us not to despair at our increasingly secular society, for there is growth and vibrancy in churches in many parts of the world. We pray for strength and wisdom for their leaders, especially when faced with state opposition. We pray for our own circuit here in Stockton and for this church and all its members. We pray for our ministers and local preachers and worship leaders. We pray that in faith and unity, we all may be constantly <coughs> renewed by your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for our own country and its peoples, for the King and all who hold authority and power, that through Christ's love and mercy, all may strive in seeking what is best for all our citizens, regardless of origin or status. As the emotive topic of immigration remains in the headlines, we pray for tolerance and harmony between all citizens that we may love our neighbours as ourselves. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those in most need in our own families and neighbourhoods, thinking of the sick, the lonely, the housebound, and those at the margins of society. We pray for the work of healthcare professionals and social workers and those whose lives are constrained by their care of loved ones. We ask that you bestow on them your gifts of patience, compassion and understanding. And we pray now for those that we know who are sick, lonely, anxious, bereaved or in some other special need at this time as we share a brief moment of silence together. As we have named them in our hearts, so let them feel your presence and friendship in their lives as we commit them to your loving care. And may we always be alert to the needs of others. Lord, in your mercy. And a final prayer for ourselves. Help us, loving God, as we seek guidance and strength to do your will as lived out and revealed to us by your Son. In the end, we shall be judged not through the eyes of the world, but through the eyes of Jesus. Help us then to view others with his understanding, compassion, and most of all, his love. And so, merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour and King, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
we will now have our offering. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we ask you to accept these gifts of money as tokens of our love for you. But together with the money, we bring to you once more the greater gift of ourselves. And we pray that gifts and givers may be used to the glory of your name here upon earth. Amen. We stand together again to sing our final hymn this morning, hymn number 661, Give Me Faith Which Can Remove, hymn 661. Father, we thank you for this time of worship and we pray for your blessing upon each one of us as we leave today. We pray that you will take us home safely this morning. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>